Chapter Eighteen of Among the Farmyard People by Clara Dillingham Pearson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Claire. The oxen talk with the calves. It was a clear, cold winter morning, and the cattle stood in the barnyard where the great yellow straw stacks were. They had nibbled away at the lower part of these stacks until there was a sheltered place underneath. The calves liked to stand on the sunshiny side with an overhanging ledge of straw above their heads. The wind did not strike them there, and they could reach up and pull out wisps to eat when they had nothing else to do. Not that they were so fond of eating straw, but it was fun to pull it out. There was, however, usually something else to be done, for there was always their cud to chew. Among all the farmyard people, there were none more particular about their food. They might eat in a hurry when time was short, or when the grass was fresh and green, but after they had swallowed it and filled the first of their four stomachs with partly chewed food, they would find some quiet and comfortable place where they could stand or lie easily and finish their eating. To do this they had to bring the partly chewed food from the first stomach to the mouth again. They called this unswallowing it, although they should have said regurgitating. After the food was back in their mouths again it was spoken of as their cud, and the stout muscles in the side of their faces pulled their lower jaws up and down and sideways, and the food was caught over and over again between the blunt grinding teeth in the back part of their mouths, and was crushed, squeezed, and turned until it was fine, soft, and ready to swallow into the second stomach. Then the cattle do not have to think of it again, but while they are doing something quite different, and perhaps forgetting all about it, there are many nerves and muscles, and fine red blood drops, as busy as can be, passing it into the third and fourth stomachs, and changing the strength of the food into the strength of the cattle. The cows and the oxen do not know this, they never heard, of muscles and nerves, and perhaps you never did before, yet these are wonderful little helpers and good friends if one is kind to them. All that cattle know about eating is that they must have clean food, that they must eat because they are hungry and not just because it tastes good, and that they must chew it very carefully. And if they do these things as they should, they are quite sure to be well and comfortable. The oxen were standing by the barn door and the calves were talking about them. They liked their uncles, the oxen, very much. But like many other calves the world over, they thought them rather slow and old-fashioned. Now the colts had been saying the same thing, and so these half-dozen shaggy youngsters, who hadn't a sign of a horn, were telling what they would do if they were oxen. Sometimes they spoke more loudly than they meant to, and the oxen heard them, but they did not know this. "'If I were an ox,' said one, "'I wouldn't stand still and let the farmer put that heavy yoke on my neck. I'd edge away and kick.' "'Tell you what I'd do,' said another. I'd stand right still when he tried to make me go, and I wouldn't stir until I got ready. I wouldn't do that, said a third. I'd run away and upset the stone in a ditch. I don't think it's fair to always make them pull the heavy loads while the horses have all the fun of taking the farmer to town and drawing the binder and all the other wonderful machines. Isn't it too bad that you're not oxen, said a deep voice behind them. The calves jumped, and there was the off-ox close to them. He was so near that you could not have set a chicken coop between him and them, and he had heard every word. The calves did not know where to look or what to say, for they had not been speaking very politely. The one who had just spoken wanted to act easy and as though he did not care, so he raised one hind hoof to scratch his ear and gave his brushy tail a toss over one flank. "'Oh, I don't know,' said he. "'I used to talk in just that way when I was a calf,' said the off-ox, with a twinkle in his large brown eyes. All calves think they'll do wonders when they're grown. I know I thought so, said the nigh ox, who had followed his brother. Well, if you wanted to, asked the red calf, why don't you do these things now? The others wondered how he dared to ask such a question. It doesn't pay, said the nigh ox. Do all your frisking in playtime. I like fun as well as anybody, yet when our yoke is taken from its peg, I say business is business, and the closer we stick to it the better. I knew a sitting hen once who wanted to see everything that happened. She was always running out to see somebody or other, and sometimes she stayed longer than she meant to. I told her she'd better stick to her nest, and she said she didn't believe in working all the time. How soon did her chickens hatch? asked the calves all together. Never did hatch, of course, chuckled the nigh ox. She fooled herself into thinking she was working, and she made a great fuss about her legs aching and her giving up society, but she couldn't fool that nest full of eggs. They had gotten cold, and they knew it, and not one of them would hatch. "'Wasn't she ashamed, then?' asked the calves. "'Didn't act so,' snorted the nigh-ox. 
went around talking about her great disappointment, and said she couldn't see why the other hens had so much better luck. The off ox chuckled. He told her that he guessed it might have been something besides bad luck, and that the next time she'd better stay on her nest more. Then she asked him how many broods of chickens he had hatched. Ho, ho, ho! Everybody laughed, and the calves wondered how the nigh ox could think of it without being angry. It wouldn't pay to be angry, he said. What's the use of wasting a fine great ox temper on a poor little hen rudeness? This made them think. They remembered how cross and hot and uncomfortable they often became over very small things that bothered them, and they began to think that perhaps even calf tempers were worth caring for. At last the black calf, the prettiest one in the yard, said, Do you like drawing that flat wagon which hasn't any wheels and scrapes along in the dust? The stone boat, asked the off-ox. We don't mind it. Never mind doing our kind of work. Wouldn't like to pull the binder with its shining knives and whirling arms, for whoever does that has to walk fast and make sudden turns and stops. Wouldn't like being hitched to the carriage to carry the farmer's family to town. Wouldn't like to take care of the sheep, like Collie, or to grow feathers like the geese. But we can draw stone boats and all sorts of heavy loads, if we do say it. The red calf, who was always running and kicking up his heel, said, Oh, it's such slow work. I should think you'd feel that you would never reach the end of your journey. We don't think about that, answered the nigh ox. It doesn't pay. We used to, though. I remember the time when I wished myself a swallow, flying a mile a minute instead of step, step, stepping my way through life. My mother was a sensible cow, and wore the bell in our herd. She cured me of that foolishness. She told me that swallows had to fly one wing beat at a time, and that dinners had to be eaten one mouthful at a time, and that nothing really worth while could be done in a minute. She said that if we were forever thinking how much work we had to do and how tiresome it was, we'd never enjoy life and we wouldn't live long either. Lazy oxen never do. That's another thing which doesn't pay. The red calf and the white calf spoke together. We will always be sensible. We will never lose our tempers. We will never be afraid to work. We will be fine and long-lived cattle. Might you not better say you will try to be sensible? asked the nigh ox. You know it is not always easy to do those things, and one has to begin over and over again. Oh, no, they answered. We know what we can do. You might be mistaken, said the oxen gently. I am never mistaken, said the red calf. Neither am I, said the white calf. Well, good morning, called the oxen as they moved off. We are going to talk with our sisters, the cows. After they had gone, the pretty black calf spoke in her pleasant way. It seems to me I shall be an old cow before I can learn to be good and sensible like them, but I am going to try. Who? said the red calf. It is easy enough to be sensible if you want to be, as easy as eating. Yes, said the white calf, I shall never lose my temper again, now that I am sure it is foolish to do so. Dear me, said the pretty black calf, how strong and good you must be. I can only keep on trying. Pooh, said the red calf again. Then he lowered his voice and spoke to her. Move along, said he, and let me stand beside you in the cubby while I chew my cud. Don't you do it, cried the white calf. I want that place myself. I guess not, exclaimed the red calf. I'll bunt you first. Bunt away, then, said the white calf, but I'll have that place. Oh, please don't fight, exclaimed the black calf. I'll let one of you have my corner. Don't you move, cried each of them. I want to stand by you. Then they lowered their heads and looked into each other's eyes. Next, they put their hard foreheads together and pushed and pushed and pushed. Sometimes the red calf made the white calf go backward, and sometimes it was the other way. Once in a while they stood still and rested. Then they began pushing again. While they were quarrelling in this way, getting warmer and more angry all the time, and losing those very tempers which they had said they would always keep, a young Jersey had stepped into the cubby beside the black calf, and they were having a pleasant visit. "'What are those fellows fighting about?' he asked. The black calf smiled a funny little smile. "'They are fighting,' said she, "'to see which one shall stand in the cubby with me and chew his cud.' The Jersey calf was a shrewd young fellow of very good family. Perhaps, said he, I ought to stay and guard the place until it is decided who shall have it. I wish you would, said she. And that was how it happened that the two calves who lost their tempers had a cross, tiresome, and uncomfortable day, while another had the very corner which they wanted. When night came, they grumbled because the Jersey calf had come out ahead of them, and they thought it very strange. But it was not strange, for the people who are quiet and good-natured always come out ahead in the end. 
and the people who are so very sure that it is easy to be good when they really want to, are just the very ones who sometimes do not want to when they should. The black calf was right. The only way to be sensible and happy is to try and try and try, and it does pay. End of chapter 18 Recording by Claire End of Among the Farmyard People by Clara Dillingham Pearson